Hi, dance friends, and welcome to the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. And I'm Amy Brandt. We are editors at Dance Media, and today we'll begin with a headline rundown covering the tragic, really just unbelievable news about Stephen Twitch Boss. All the show turnover that is happening or about to happen on Broadway, and the two latest ballet companies to begin unionizing. Then we will have a longer discussion about the news that the Washington Post has laid off dance critic Sarah Kaufman, in fact, eliminated its dance critic position entirely, and about how that ties into larger scale changes that are happening in dance journalism. We're going to have a real state of the industry moment today. So no further preamble, I'm going to start the headline rundown with news that still does not seem real. Just before recording, we heard that Stephen Twitch Boss had died at age 40. Boss was a contestant and then all-star and judge on So You Think You Can Dance, which is where he met wife Allison Holker Boss. He was also the longtime DJ, or faux DJ, he wasn't actually a DJ, but also co-executive producer for The Ellen DeGeneres Show. He was really the, the glue that held that show together. And it is extremely hard to overstate the influence of this incredibly gifted artist and just incredibly kind person. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really know Twitch. Um, I just had the privilege of interviewing him several times, but even in those limited interactions, it was just so abundantly clear that he was one of the warmest and most generous and most genuine people in the whole business. And he brought that warmth and generosity to everything he did in the dance world and, and beyond the dance world. So it's just hard to make sense of it. And I'm sorry, Amy, this is a rough segue mm. for you. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. This is unbelievably sad. And he just personified joy in so many ways. So it's just really hard to process right now. Mm -hmm. um, Broadway's Phantom of the Opera, which announced that it would be closing in February after 35 years on the Great White Way, has extended its farewell run by eight weeks. The reason news of its closing triggered a big surge in ticket sales, not enough for the show to remain on Broadway long term, but enough to keep it going for a while longer. So now I really need to get those tickets. Um, here is some Broadway news that truly shocked a lot of people, myself included. The musical K-pop closed abruptly on December 11th after just 17 non-preview performances. Uh, the closing followed a public dispute between the show's company and New York Times theater critic Jesse Green, with producers describing Green's negative review of the show as, quote, casual racism, unquote. K-pop dedicated its final performance to the AAPI community, and we have more that you can read about all of that in the show notes. I was really surprised to hear that, and I was really honestly looking forward to seeing the show on Broadway. I know. Same. It sounded like it was going to be awesome. It had a really devoted fan base, even in the brief period that it was open. People were super, super excited about it. Mm -hmm. The off-Broadway show Stomp has also announced that it is closing after 29 years, although it will continue to tour in North America and Europe. The show, a mix of percussive music and dance, cited the pandemic and the fact that audiences haven't really fully returned as reasons for closing. Gosh, I mean, I remember seeing Stomp in, I think, 1998. It was my first trip to New York City. It was, it's had quite an amazing run, so it's great that it's still continuing on tour, at least. Yeah. It does feel like a lot of New York show eras are coming to an end. Mm -hmm. um, but swinging the pendulum back to the, the happy side of Broadway, a reimagined production of The Wiz will tour nationally before coming to Broadway in the spring of 2024. Yay. Notably, the show will feature choreography by Jaquel Knight, making his Broadway debut. Double Yay, yay. again. Yeah. I feel like when dance talent from the commercial world crosses over to Broadway this way, sparks tend to fly. So yeah, I can't wait yeah. to see Jaquel's spin on the show. Also coming to Broadway is a new Britney Spears musical. Once Upon a One More Time featuring Spears music will open in previews in May with opening night currently slated for June 22nd. The musical centers around a group of fairy tale princesses whose lives change when they're given a copy of The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan by their fairy godmother. It is directed by hip hop duo Keone and Mari Madrid. So that should be fun. 
Yeah, I mean, the show got sort of middling reviews when it ran in DC last fall. Mm. But I mean, the potential seems so enormous. Like, I mean, Keone and Mari, also commercial crossover artists, incredibly talented. Totally, so, yeah. yeah. Staying tuned there. Yeah. All right, moving into the ballet world, Ukraine's culture minister is calling on the country's Western allies to boycott Tchaikovsky and other Russian artists and composers until Russia ends its invasion of Ukraine. Many cultural institutions have already taken steps along that path since the war began, but the biggest ask here is to ballet companies who would have to pause performances of The Nutcracker with its Tchaikovsky score. And so far, ballet organizations have mostly not budged. They've carried on with Nutcracker season. In a statement to NPR, a Royal Ballet spokesperson said, quote, the presentation of great historic works such as The Nutcracker performed by an international roster of dancers should send a powerful statement that Tchaikovsky, himself of Ukrainian heritage, and his work speak to all humanity in direct and powerful opposition to the narrow and nationalistic view of culture peddled by the Kremlin, end quote. And we've got that whole NPR story for you in the show notes. The American Guild of Musical Artists has announced that two ballet companies have begun the process towards unionization. Texas Ballet Theater and Ballet Memphis have signed authorization cards to form their unions with AGMA. It's, a, it's, it's definitely an interesting development, I think. That more and more companies are unionizing. Yeah. yeah especially yeah. these smaller companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here is some news that broke kind of late in the game, it turns out that a dance festival has been happening in Qatar alongside the World Cup, um, a festival we didn't really hear much about until right as it was starting. It's worth noting that many people, myself included, have been having complicated feelings about this year's World Cup, uh, but the dance festival curated by Benjamin Millipier and Nico Muley, so two very big names, is featuring free performances at venues all over the country by a range of international dance artists, including, of course, Millipede's own LA Dance Project um, and some other probably pretty familiar names. Yeah, I think Bobby Jean Smith is included in that. Bobby that? Jean Smith, Janie Taylor, um, Madeline Hollander. It's, a, it's, yeah, a pretty impressive list. Mm -hmm. Two ballet icons are getting honored in big ways. Native American ballerina Maria Tall Chief will appear on the back of U.S. Quarters next year. This is in addition to the $1 gold coin that will feature the five moon ballerinas, where Maria is prominently featured, along with her sister Marjorie Tall Chief, Rosella Hightower, Mosclin Larkin, and Yvonne Chateau. Um, so that's here in the U.S. In Italy, Carla Fracci has been honored with a commemorative stamp, part of a collection featuring Italian artists who died between 2021 and 2022. Always love seeing dance artists being honored in mass-produced ways. <laughs> Absolutely. I was just going to say, and I, I've said this before, more dancers on more stamps and more coins all the mm -hmm. time. Let's do it. The 2023 Young Arts Award winners have been announced. There are 702 winners in total, all ages 15 to 18, in a range of categories. But of course, special congratulations to the pretty darn extraordinary finalists in the dance category. And we have the full list of names linked in the show notes. Such a great organization. Really, really helpful for, yeah. young, for young artists. If you've been watching Instagram and TikTok, you may have noticed a fun battle between American Ballet Theater and Dutch National Ballet. ABT dancer Connor Holloway, who helps manage the company's social media with another dancer, Cy Doherty, um, is often seen interviewing the dancers with his signature miniature microphone. And uh, in one of his recent ones, asked a bunch of dancers what their least favorite step was. The overwhelming winner, of course, was Gargliad. The worst, yes. <laughs> When Dutch National Ballet Grand Sujet, Daniel Montero Real copied Holloway's style in his own Instagram takeover for uh, the Dutch company and then apologized for copying his style publicly, Holloway accepted but challenged him to show the world his gargliade. And the resulting videos that came afterwards are just hysterical. They include cameos by Tyler Peck, um, a last minute trip for Holloway to Amsterdam and a hilarious, very highly produced video at the end. Needless to say, it was a hoot. And uh, we hope these cross company collaborations on social media keep happening. It's really fun. I mean, it's been like a particularly hard couple of weeks 
following a string of like very hard weeks, which makes this an even more needed gift, like just mm-hmm. the most delightful and delightfully <laughs> nerdy thing happening on the internet right now. And I'm sorry, Olga Smirnova's cameo oh, yes, in that Olga final Smirnova. video is meant to add her perfection yes it's so great we have linked um ballet herald's kind of explainer of the whole thing in the show notes you can check that out Mm -hmm. can you hear my cat losing her mind i can good grief (laughs) apologies listeners if you can hear my cat um in other viral dance news actor jenna ortega's wonderfully weird dance from the series wednesday has taken on a life of its own on tiktok where fans are copying and riffing on the choreography. And Ortega actually created that choreography herself with inspiration from, among other sources, Bob Fosse, inevitably. Um, Gia Corliss wrote a piece for the Times about why this Wednesday dance is so compelling, and we have that linked for you. It's very fun. And and, and it's really interesting to read about all the influences that she tapped for that particular yeah. dance. Yeah. And finally, the dance world has lost um, two other greats this month, former Martha Graham dancer Susan Kikuchi, who went on to stage Graham's works worldwide, as well as revivals of Jerome Robbins' The King and I, died on November 14th at the age of 74. She definitely grew up in the Graham world. Her mother was the famed Graham dancer Yuriko, who died earlier this year at the age of 102. So two great losses there in one family. And Dame Beryl Gray, a principal ballerina with the Royal Ballet who went on to lead London Festival Ballet, now called English National Ballet, passed away at the age of 95. She was the first British ballerina to dance in Russia with the Bolshoi and in Beijing and had a thriving freelance career after leaving the Royal Ballet in 1957. So hats off to Dame Beryl Gray. So that is the end of our headline rundown this episode. Um, Here is, of course, your reminder to take a look at the Dance Media Events calendar as well, because it has lots more information about all kinds of Dance World events. You know, we're starting to see a lot of spring season announcements. We're starting to see a lot of audition information coming out. We don't always have time to get to that here on the podcast, but it's there in the calendar. So to see the full list and to add your own events to it, head to dancemediacalendar.com. Alrighty, it's time for our longer segment, which concerns the news heard around the dance writing world. Earlier this month, as part of a spate of job eliminations, the Washington Post laid off its dance critic of a quarter century, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Sarah Kaufman. And that means, I believe, that Gia Corliss at the New York Times is now the only full time dance critic in the country, the entire country. Obviously, this is of great interest to Amy and me as dance journalists, but it really should be of interest to anybody invested in dance and the dance community. Um, We're living through a massive shift in journalism as a whole, obviously with the decline of traditional media affecting the very nature of criticism, what it means to be a critic, who gets heavy quotation marks to weigh in, where the conversations are happening. And During this time, dance writing in the mainstream press has dwindled to almost nothing. So what does that mean for the dance world more broadly? Like, There's definitely been a great sense of loss, especially among us journalists, which is absolutely merited. We are losing something important, and we want to talk about why it's important. But what can be gained from this shift, too? And you know, where do we go from here? This is not a new conversation, but even after many years now of thinking about it, it still feels urgent and unresolved. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. I danced in DC for 10 years and my company was often a target of negative reviews by Sarah Kaufman. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But while dancers often have cynical or complicated feelings towards, you know, dance critics, especially their local their local critics. I think most would agree that the post elimination of Kaufman's position is is not good news. You know, dance has always kind of been on the fringes of popular culture and often treated as less than in among the classical arts as well, you know, compared to mm-hmm. music and mm-hmm. and opera and whatnot. But um now it just feels like it's being pushed even more 
to the fringes. And, you know, you really have to be an enthusiast already or a dancer yourself to kind of know where the dance specific publications and blogs are, you know, so where will Mm -hmm. the general reader hear about new productions or, you know, perhaps be able to delve more thoughtfully into something they've just seen by reading a review. There are other great publications like Fjord Review, Ballet Herald, Broadway World, Bach Track that have dance reviews still. But you kind of already have to be aware of them to know about these platforms. And I'm curious if the Washington Post will continue writing features and previews of dance productions um, you know, maybe by freelance arts and culture journalists, or if this just just kind of a general end to frequent dance coverage, or just, I don't know. I mean, hopefully they keep commissioning freelancers, but even so, the elimination of a staff dance critic position mm-hmm. is a major blow to this industry, mm-hmm. that there were only two at this point anyway, was yeah. pretty insane. Um Thank you for pointing out, though, Amy, that, yeah, it's not if you're an obsessive, there are plenty of places to read actually really interesting and insightful Mm -hmm. writing about dance. But if you're not, it's almost invisible to you now at this point, writing about dance. It'll be interesting to see how, like, the Kennedy Center, the Washington Ballet, some of these Mm -hmm. cultural institutions based in D.C., how will they handle this, you know, going forward? Will this, you know, affect how they market things and and they invest more in in different types of ways of reaching new audiences. Right. Um, And how will that affect the discourse around dance when mm -hmm. what we're hearing about dance, we're hearing from venues and producers as opposed to journalists. Right. Right. Um, It's, it's been interesting watching the way, yeah, critical discourse around dance has evolved even since like I first started at dance media back in like 2008. There used to be this sense of and this is not unique to dance, but there used to be the sense of reviews as like pronouncements from mm-hmm. on high. And like, maybe you would compare multiple critics reviews to each other. Gosh, remember when there used to be multiple reviews of mm-hmm. most dance shows? Um, and maybe you would, you know, grumble about or endorse some critics perspective, like at the proverbial water cooler, but the level of engagement with that writing was relatively minimal. And what Mm -hmm. I do like about the digital transformation and the rise of social media is, as many, many people have said before me, first of all, the lack of gatekeeping. Now Mm -hmm. more voices are able to contribute to the conversation. But also I think it's changed the way we think about criticism, where a review has become not the end of a conversation, but the beginning Beginning. of a conversation. And I think smart critics know that. And honestly, the best dance critics, I think their writing has evolved accordingly in a way that can be really constructive. Like the impulse Mm -hmm. is not to pass an absolute judgment, but to provide context and insight Mm -hmm. and yeah, start conversations rather than end them. History. Yeah. And then I love seeing those threads picked up or like sometimes snipped through by (laughs) brilliant people on TikTok and Twitter. And there's a lot of that happening. Yeah. And and let's also be honest, like for a long time, the dance critic has been part of a particular demographic, you know, Mm -hmm. white, often classically inclined, you know, Mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps less able to speak authoritatively on social and street dance forms or non-European dance forms. And so this maybe opens up the door to more voices, more new kinds of voices in dance journalism now that, you know, it's not occupied by one person. Yeah, I want to hope that's true. I guess the issue is that one of the biggest reasons the demographic for dance writers has been so narrow is because it pays pretty much nothing and offers no Mm -hmm. stability. So if you're not wealthy and privileged to begin with, it's a tough business to be in. Um, And that's something that the writer Marina Harse noted in a story in Dance Magazine last year. Like, Mm -hmm. how can we attract more diverse artists to this profession if we are offering them so little? Like, it's a profession that's not really a profession anymore, she says. I mean, a a lot of these, you know, it's you're basically volunteering. You're writing for free or you're getting paid very little. I mean, you know, Margaret, you and I are incredibly lucky to have the jobs that we have, you know, Mm -hmm. as editors and that they are full-time positions and whatnot. But, you know, when I talk to to college students or or young young people who are interested in becoming a dance writer i feel like one of the i i feel like i have to be very upfront with them about mm-hmm. 
you know, that's wonderful, but make sure you have broad education and that you also can write about other things and that it's just nearly impossible to make a living off of writing about dance. Mm -hmm. You know, there are clearly big overlaps here too with the way the creation of dance itself is and is not supported in this country Mm -hmm. with the way that we as a nation like assign value or more commonly do not assign value to the arts because yes, good dance journalism is an art. So it's all part of the same question is how can we support this kind of art making in a way that is sustainable? So it's not automatically a sacrifice, a labor of love, but an actual vocation. Mm -hmm. Um, As is so often the case, we don't have answers. We're just trying to get to the right questions. But in the show notes, we've linked to the Washington Post story on Sarah Kaufman's departure and to Sarah's final review for the paper, which included a poignant sign off. And then also to Marina Harse's dance magazine story about the reality of dance writing today, which is depressing, but necessary read, Mm -hmm. I think. All right, that's it for us this week. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, We're going to have actually two interview episodes in a row over this holiday break. So look forward to that. In the meantime, keep learning, keep advocating and keep dancing. Happy holidays, everyone. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Amy Brandt, Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, and Lydia Murray. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those footfall sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.